So last week in class, I showed this titration curve for glycine, and I had talked about it in a previous class, and I started off um, the following class asking you guys to write on index cards what the clearest point and the muddiest points are looking at this titration curve. And I want to thank you all for your participation. There was a lot of great um, comments handed in, and I want to address some of the ones that came up most commonly. So one thing that came up a lot was well what is pi and what's its significance like why should we care um, another very common point that came up was um, what are these two pKa values exactly and how do they relate to these blue boxes are they buffer regions or are they not they are buffer regions um, but I think a lot of you wanted to know more about what that means. And many people wanted to talk about this, uh, the difference between PI and PKA. And also something that came up quite commonly, which I thought was really cool because I hadn't really thought about addressing this, is why does this part of the curve rise so sharply? Why is it vertical? which is a really interesting question because it also kind of the flip side is that well why does it flatten out over here and over here and I think the first thing to do in order to answer a lot of these questions is to go back and I think because this class the content builds on itself so much I think it actually is a really good thing to do is to go back to the earlier lecture notes like go back to the first time we talked about PKA and look over their note, those notes again, and this time think about it in terms of amino acids. So we've been laying the foundation for this for <clears throat> many lectures, and now we're getting to this complicated part because we're actually getting to amino acids and proteins, but go back and revisit those foundations, and I want to do that with you right now. So the first time I showed a titration curve, it was for uh, acetic acid, and This was a weak acid getting titrated with a strong base. And at the beginning, everyone felt, I felt like in class at least, everyone felt pretty comfortable saying, you know, at the beginning of titration, you've got um, oops, the acid form and only the acid form present. As you raise the pH by adding strong base, when you get to the point that pH equals pKa. So pH is describing the surroundings. pKa is an intrinsic value of a particular chemical group. It basically tells you um, about the tendency for a group to give away its protons. If this number is small, the tendency is high. It's a strong acid. It'll have a low pKa. So at this point, you're going to have equal amounts of the acid form and the base form. And then you keep adding more and more strong base to the point where you have completely transformed all of the acid into the conjugate base form. So at that point, all of the all of this group is deprotonated, one equivalent of strong base is added, has been added because it has deprotonated an equivalent molar amount of this titratable group. Now if you have, this only ha there's only one titratable group on this molecule, so you only go to one equivalent. If there's another titratable group, you go to two equivalents. If you, there's three titratable groups, you go to three equivalents. So this equivalence is, a, is the units of strong base added, and it allows us to acknowledge the balance and the ratio between the strong base you add and the group that's getting deprotonated. So you might have noticed at the pKa, you would have gotten halfway there to total deprotonation, and so you have half an equivalent that's been added. So what is this titration curve showing us? It's telling us a story where we took 
um, a weak acid and we added some strong base and that strong base and the proton from this ionizable group join together to leave behind the conjugate base and water. And so that the more strong base you add, the more deprotonation you get. And so then why does this line for the titration curve flatten out toward around pKa? And you'll find that this buffer zone, which is plus or minus one unit around the pKa, is called the buffer zone because there's enough of the acid and enough of the base to balance out anything that you, oh, sorry, I should say, to balance out any strong base or strong acid that you add. So basically, you have minimal pH change. in the buffer zone. Why is that? It's because you'll have enough of both acetic acid and acetate, both the acid form and the base form, to balance out any OH or H that you add. So if the pH doesn't change, that means you're not changing the concentration of free floating protons in your solution. Even if you add some to the situation, in the buffer zone, you add some of that H in there, and what it'll do is it will join with the conjugate base and form acetic acid and guess what you have not changed free floating H concentration right the H that you added that got sucked right into the conjugate base and pH is not going to get affected now the flip side is if you're in the buffer zone where you've got a significant amount of both of these around then let's say what happens if you add some OH? That should technically change your pH value, right? But no, not if you have an enough amount of these species around because <clears throat> the OH will join up with the H from the acetic acid. Acetic acid will donate its proton. The OH will change into water. The acetic acid just turns into its conjugate base, and guess what? Again, no change in proton concentration, so minimal change in pH. So we go back over here, and we ask, why does this line flatten out? It's because you have enough amounts of these acid and conjugate base. Now, what do I mean by enough amounts? Well, all of our practice with Henderson-Hasselbach can now add some numbers to this titration curve. So if the pH is 4.76, you're going to be 50% HA, 50% A minus. Now the buffer region is plus or minus one. You go down one pH unit to 3.76. Now you've got 91% HA, and almost 10% A minus, still enough of both. But you can see that any lower than 3.76, you're gonna start seeing some pH changes if you perturb the OH concentration to the H concentration because you won't have enough of both species to balance it out. Namely, you won't have enough of the conjugate base. So that's your outer limit. Likewise, you go in the other direction 
if you, if the oh. sorry about that if the concentration of sorry if the pH value is 5.76 then you're going to have 91% of the conjugate base, 9% of the acid, still enough of both to act in a buffer capacity, as we showed in this figure. So these two figures I showed several lectures ago, but it helps a lot to go back and re- uh, re-examine these now with some extra knowledge that we have, like the stuff I've written on the left side of this slide. So now let's go back to the glycine titration curve. So if you were to look just at this part, it looks a lot like the titration curve we just looked, for, looked at, where there was just one group. Same goes for just this part. So now we're just dealing with a titration curve that has two groups that are titrating. And let's just focus up on this first group. This is going to be the molecule of glycine that you'll find around this, in the, at the beginning of the titration curve is going to be totally protonated. Apologies for this messiness. I'm getting to the edge of my screen. And this is what you'll see at the beginning of a titration. Remember, the titration is you've got a weak acid and you're going to add strong base and deprotonate it. And so the first group that gets deprotonated is the group with the lower pKa, and it's going to be the carboxylic acid group. Its pKa is 2.34, so as you add strong base, that's the group that's going to start getting deprotonated. And at this first point, you'll see half of the glycines will have a COH group, half of them will have a CO- group, so it'll be 50% for each. Now, what does the amino group look like? For both of these, the amino group is still NH3. And that's because we are far away from the pKa of the amino group. We're many, many pH units below its pKa, and so that's going to be completely protonated. And so this is a buffer region because look, we have significant amounts of a base and it's um, of an acid and its conjugate base. And when you have enough of both of those around, what you've got yourself is you got yourself a buffer zone. So this is the same stuff I just talked about with the acetic acid titration. We now are now seeing in an amino acid. It's just now we have two groups that we're thinking about. And as you keep adding OHs, you're going to deprotonate to the point where you're going to reach the first equivalence point where all of the glycine will have a COO minus on it. I'll talk about PI in a second, but first I want to talk about the second pKa. So we talked about the first pKa of the carboxylic acid group glycine has another titratable group. And that other group is that amino group. And so as you get closer, the pK of this group is 9.6. As you get closer to 9.6, this group will start getting deprotonated. And so remember, pKa is a... Is a an intrinsic value of a functional group or a chemical group, and it's going to tell you about like the ease at which it's going to get deprotonated um, along a pH scale. So this group isn't very isn't a very strong acid.
acid, it actually doesn't start deprotonating until pretty up there in the pH scale. So it'll really start deprotonating at around 8.6, where you get a 91, uh, where you start getting 9% deprotonating. And that's the edge of the buffer zone when it comes to the amino group. So glycine can act as a buffer around two pH ranges. It can act as a buffer in the range of pH between 1.34 and 3.34. It can also act as a buffer if your solution is at a pH range of 8.6 to 10.6. It just matters, um, what matters in those two different scenarios is who's doing the buffering, which groups are the conjugate base and acid. So at the second pKa, which is 9.6, which is telling us about the protonation or deprotonation of the amino group, if the pH is equal to 9.6, half of the molecules will look like this and half of them will have been deprotonated on the amino group. And so that's what you'll see at this pH. So this is something that came up quite a bit when I was reading the index cards. And it's, um, I think it's important for me to bring it up now, is that pH describes the solution. So do I have um, a, a solution of glycine that's at 5, a pH of 5? Do I have a solution of glycine that's a pH 7? Do I have a solution of glycine that's pH 10? That's just a description of the solution. And I, you'd have to be told what the pH of a solution is, um, or you have a pH meter and you can measure it. That's actually a question that came up on in the index cards. So where is that? Where is the pH coming from? You have a pH meter, so you have your solution, and you have a pH meter which is, has an electrode. You stick it in there, and it'll tell you what the pH of your solution is. Now this is very different from pKa which for some reason they just say PK1, PK2. I don't know why they left off the little PKA here. Same difference. But PKA is an intrinsic quality of a chemical group. So it's a characteristic. So I brought this up very early on in the class, but it's coming back to us in a context, which is why, again, I think it's good to go back and look over some of those earlier notes. So lastly, many people asked about PI. What is PI? What's its significance? And so we know that the structure of a molecule is really crucial for its function, and, and part of its structure might be charge. So if a molecule has a charge or not have a charge, it's going to probably affect its function. And so it's really interesting and important to know at what pH value a molecule is neutral or uncharged. And that's what PI tells you. PI is again an intrinsic value of a molecule that just tells you when is this molecule, in what conditions will this molecule be neutral. So remember pH is just a condition what condition leads this molecule to be uncharged? And in the case of glycine, we mean overall charge. We always mean overall charge. And in the case of glycine, this neutral charge comes about because at the PI, you've got one group that's protonated, another group that's deprotonated, plus and minus cancel each other out for zero. So the significance of PI can also be utilized in the laboratory. We've already gone through an example in class 
where we talked about having a column that's filled with resin that's negatively charged. And we take advantage of different amino acids, PIs, to separate them to get to separate them from each other. I will be posting another video talking about that experiment since somebody requested that. But that's a great example of the significance of PI. We're using it in the laboratory to separate amino acids. This will be a theme later on. Separating a protein from all the other proteins in a cell, doing that in the laboratory, you will take advantage of some of the things that are different between proteins. And guess what? PI is one of those characteristics. We'll talk about that when we talk about protein separation later. So the talk that I, the explanation of the buffer region before that I talked about where you see the flattening of this line, well this answer, now I can go to the answer, the question that came up a lot is why is this line so vertical? What does a vertical line mean in this experiment. You can read that off the graph. A vertical line means very dramatic pH change. A tiny little bit of OH added and you get incredible change in pH. Why is that? It's because you don't have enough of conjugate acid. Well, I shouldn't say equals. You don't have enough of the acid or conjugate base form in this area to buffer any pH changes. So you add some OH and you're going to really affect the pH of your system. You're really going to affect the pH of your solution because you don't have an acid in its conjugate base to soak up the OH that you added. So the HA and A- minus I'm talking about, they could be the carboxyl group, they could be the amino group. Which one acts as the buffer pair depends on which pH your solution happens to be at. So I'm hoping this cleared up some of the questions or most of the questions that you asked. Please do um, post more questions on Piazza if there's anything more I can clarify.